Shall we open a prayer? Yeah. Let's go ahead and do that. Lord, thank you so much for what you show us in your word. We pray for a measure of wisdom tonight and clarity. And uh, Lord, that you'd clear the cobwebs of any confusion and help us to zero in on some, some more details now. Looking at um, evidences and proofs or not for the rapture, some of these rapture passages. And uh, Lord, we pray that as we study some of this, it'll it'll help to inform the book of Revelation a little bit better um, as we get there, as we plow on forward. Lord, we just want to know more about what your plans are for us. We get excited about what you have revealed in your word. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you reveal even a little bit more tonight. For it's in Christ's name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. All right, so... This handy dandy little outline here. Matthew 24 outline. Did you print it out for us? I sent it an email. Um, you could have printed it, I guess. You could have wrote it down. Yeah. What we'll, we will do is um, we're going to move on to the second part. So, what we really looked at last week and was. Um, the first 14 verses that answers the question, when will these things be? And as we found, there is some overlap on uh, some of the content, some of the material Jesus covers. There we go. Um, this one. When will these things be? And you can see that it what he's describing are things that happened in their immediate future, which turned out to be not terribly immediate, but relatively speaking to where we are today, it's immediate, right? The year 70 AD. Some of those things happened in 70 AD, but the things that happened in 70 AD are kind of a foreshadowing of a more complete fulfillment during the Great Tribulation. And this is the way we found that Bible prophecies usually are is a pattern, more than just prediction and then a fulfillment. We see a, a pattern. And we gave the example before of, uh, of the abomination of desolation and, and uh, Antiochus, how uh, that was fulfilled a couple hundred years before Christ. And yet even as that was fulfilled, when Jesus came along, he spoke in the future and said, hey, when you see this happening, as Daniel spoke about, um, the abomination that makes desolate, standing in the temple, standing in the holy place. You know, so Jesus described it as a future type of event. Um, and we looked at, again, at 70 AD, and we discussed a few reasons why um, 70 AD was not the ultimate fulfillment of that, not the final fulfillment of that. So with that, let's, let's go ahead and, and for context going into this second part of the question in here, um, we are going to just real quick read through those 14, first 14 verses, and then we will look at what will be the sign of your coming, which is verses 15 to 27, and we'll see how far we get, okay? So... Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came uh, up to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And you recall that some of the material that Jesus covered is, is going to be much of the same material that we read in Luke, Luke's account. But Luke's account was, uh, he actually, on the way to the temple, gave some accounts, was talking to the disciples and giving them some little bit of scraps of information, but 
a lot of it publicly in the temple. He gave um, a lot of this information. But then he elaborates and takes it out of the context of 70 AD and starts talking about grander, greater futuristic type of events um, as he's sitting outside here. So then verse 4, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Say that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end isn't yet. For nation will rise against nation. Remember, that's uh, race wars, ethnicities. Ethnos will rise against ethnos, and kingdom against kingdom, or country against country. Uh, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation, and kill you, and you'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. So now he's going to back up again and answer the second question, what will be the sign of your coming? So that's a different question other than when will these things be? Because when will these things be? He'd been talking about all the things leading up to 70 AD, but he knew that their question really was, when are you going to wrap this up? When are you going to sit on the throne? Because that's what they're looking forward to. They wanted to know when Jesus was going to finally overthrow the Roman government and set up his own kingdom. So now, knowing that, let's, let's just start off with just a real quick read through 15 to 27, okay? Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those... Who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who sits on the housetop not go down to take anything out of the house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, Look, he's in the desert, do not go out. Or look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For the, as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Where are your questions as far as you can start? If you want look at last week, because I want to make sure we're thorough that there's no confusion. Um, so the first 14 verses, or are there any questions about any of that before we move on? More questions might come up later. But. No, but I kind of put in context of the first question and the second question and whatnot. That helps. Because most times when I study this, you just do it all in one, and it can be a little confusing. It can be, because... That is that is a, a thing that is often missed when people study the Olivet Discourse is they don't realize they're trying to either harmonize with the other um, gospels. other gospels or with other passages they know they're trying to make sense of it without realizing that Jesus is answering their question in the order that they, they asked. So... All right, so okay, let's just let's 
plow through here, then we might make some good time. And since you guys are great students in your uh, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight be not in the winter. So it's going to be an awful time and it's going to be awful. Now, what would some of these events, some, did take place in 70 AD? We know this historically, right? Which of these events, just off the top of your heads, what, what are some of these events that did happen in 70 AD? What was some of this about? Well, what did happen? The temple was destroyed, but what else was happening then? Well, Rome was... Rome decided they, they um, wanted to sack Jerusalem, so that's what they did. They went after Jerusalem. Um, it's a long, drawn-out story. There's some back-and-forth stuff. I believe it started with... I have the facts right now. It started with one emperor, I believe it was Titus, and uh, there was some illness involved, I believe, as I recall, and he had to kind of, the advance had to halt for a little bit, and so there was some regrouping going on, and while Rome was, Rome was supplying and regrouping, that kind of gave some people who were familiar, for instance, with Luke's, with Jesus' account as recorded in Luke, and they said, hey, the Christians were saying, hey, this says here that we should head for the hills, okay. and so before they got to close off the whole city and surround the whole city, because Luke's account, you know, was very clear about, hey, when you see them surrounding the city, you need to get out of Dodge, you know, or Jerusalem. Yeah. So they did. They headed for the hills, and they, they hid out there. So, so Jerusalem was sieged. about that, too. Yeah. Mm hmm Now, was there, was there an abomination of desolation, as in spoken of by Daniel? Do, are we familiar with that passage? All it is is there's just a, a, a quick verse about it, really, in Daniel. Daniel 9, what is it, 27? Does anybody have that handy? Define handy. Yeah, I know. Where's Daniel? <laughs> Where's Daniel? He's off getting a cup of coffee. Smart. So, so you remember what happened is Daniel. Daniel was a man of prayer. And he's praying for his people. And he's Daniel knows that seventy years have come to a close. Of, of uh, he remembers the judgment when they're going to be captive. The nation Israel is going to be captive for 70 years, and he knows the time is up. So he goes on in this really long prayer, praying for his people and praying for God's mercy. And then uh, verse 20 records, Now, while I was speaking, praying, in confessing my sin and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplications, supplications when you pray for others, right? Specifically. Before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So, the man Gabriel, he's a chief angel. It's an interesting study. What you find is that angelic beings, whether they're the ones who are still angelic and holy or whether they're now the defiled demonic ones, and, uh, they tend to be, they've got territories, they're territorial. Daniel was um, praying before 
And an angel came to him and told him that the, the prince of Persia had delayed him. So this angel's trying to, angel's messenger, this angel's trying to deliver this message to Daniel, and he got tangled up by a demonic being, a chief demon called the Prince of Persia. So Persia is modern day Iran. Had him tangled up, Michael had to come and rescue him so he could get free to deliver his message to Daniel. Well, Gabriel is a, a chief angel as well. He's, and uh, there you'll find that there are some angels, some demonic forces that are. Um, tied up, bound in the angel, the uh, river Euphrates and all of this. We're going to get into that when we get a little bit further into Revelation. So we find out that there are different angelic beings with different jobs and also will have different territories and so forth. So Gabriel is delivering this particular message to him. And he gets... It seems like Gabriel gets uh, some really important mess messages to deliver when he's got something really significant to deliver. Um, he's God's chief emissary, it seems. Michael, on the other hand, is God's chief angel over Israel. So Gabriel is a, a chief spokesman for God, I guess is the way to put it. He's a, a chief emissary. So I don't know if we call him a prince or not, but he, he seems to be um, a chief spokesman for God when there's a really important message to be delivered. So in verse 22, he says, uh, And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I've now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, at the beginning of your prayer, the command went out. So this is remarkable. Daniel hadn't even finished praying yet. But at the very beginning of the prayer, God's, God knows the answer. He knows where the prayer is going to go. And he's got this message for Gabriel to deliver to him. That should give you confidence in, wow. in your prayer. I would have missed that if I was just reading that. So, <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yeah, it is. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, uh, and I have come to tell you, for you're greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So how would you want to? How would you like to hear that from an angel to you about how God looks looks at you? That you're great. Yeah, Wouldn't that be something? Be yeah. 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 It would be. That would be humbling. No. Yeah. So well, yeah, but I just sinned because I just had a little streak of pride run through me. <laughs> Pat myself on the back. So then, what happens is, um, what Gabriel delivers is a grand overview of the rest of the history of mankind as far as Israel is concerned. And all things are written from God's perspective and, his, and to his people um, at the time, um, his chosen people, Israel. Uh, everything is written in this perspective in the Old Testament in particular. Um, so he delivers this message. We, this requires like another study or, or two. But uh, let's see. Where do I want to pick up? So he gives a messianic part of the message about what the point of it is, is the Messiah and what he's going to do. Uh, he mentions the Messiah in verse 25. And then he talks about weeks in, in terms of years. A week is a, a, a grouping of seven. It can be actual days, or it can be weeks, or it can be years. And in this case, it's years. Or it can be months, I suppose. So then, verse 26, he says, after... 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it 
shall be with a flood, and all uh, until the end of, of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with me for a week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Clear as mud, right? Yeah. yeah. So, this prophecy is really ultimately about the very end of things because we're talking about what happens after the, after the uh, Messiah. There's also um, a fulfillment of prophecy about uh, Antiochus Epiphany who goes into the temple erects a statue of Zeus in, in the holy place and slaughters a pig um, God in his anger makes the statue fall down and break and all this kind of stuff Death, blood, gore, and mayhem follow. Um, so there's a, a fulfillment of this. And some people will say, yes, but it was fulfilled, this was fulfilled in 70 AD as well. The problem is, some of the components of this um, He did destroy the sanctuary the, as far as uh, I want to say the emperor is like Antiochus or the man of sin. You, you can say he destroyed the sanctuary because they burned the temple and they destroyed the city. Um, what, would, what would have been he shall confirm a, a covenant with many for one week? What, which emperor did that? Titus, Nero, any of them, none of them. There's no such thing like that that happened. In the middle of the week, he shall bring it into sacrifice and, suffer, and uh, offering. When did one of them do that? See, none of that happened at all. Um, so you see where there's kind of like a foreshadowing. So there's a kind of a partial fulfillment, and then it's fulfilled again, ultimately, much later. We, we can intersect with and spend more time with Daniel at some other point, but it, it's really lengthy talking about how, how it is and how it gets fulfilled and so forth. Um, this is part of the reason, Daniel 9 is part of the reason, by the way, why, why Jesus castigates the Pharisees for not recognizing when he came. He fulfilled all these other prophecies and so forth, but they should have been watching. They should have been counting the weeks because then they would have seen that, you know, weeks of years from the from the time of, you know, the, the very beginning of the um, prophecy when it was supposed to um, commence all the way to the time when the Messiah is cut off. That would have been the 62 weeks. They should have seen when he was... They should have expected when he was going to come walking into Jerusalem. The abomination of desolation. That's one of the things that Jesus said when you see this coming. Now, this is where you have to look at and say, uh, well, okay, so are we watching for the Antichrist then? Right? Because it, it's almost like Jesus is saying this. If you're, if you're back in Matthew 24, verse 15, it looks like that's what Jesus is saying. So, is he saying that? What, what does that mean? Because he says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, etc., etc. So, does that mean we're watching for the Antichrist? I'm sorry, I'm having a brain malfunction. There's only one that abomination that causes desolation. The temple has been destroyed, but there's only one. 
right? So far. Well, I mean, yeah. Well, that's what I was going to look. What is it again? Explain that term. Okay. So the abomination of desolation was how it was referred to when the temple was defiled. And we okay. saw the foreshadow of that with Antiochus. Well, it, it, it happened. Well, there's no evidence that that ever happened. Oh. That there was the temple was defiled and that was burned, but the holy place being defiled and all that, we don't have any evidence that that ever happened. That's what I'm saying. When that's I'm just having a brain. Here. But when it talks about the abomination that causes desolation, generally we're always looking, we're always so looking for that. Kind you've got to have you got to have the holy place, which is the yeah. temple. Yeah. Seventy AD, there was a temple, but we have no evidence that there was an abomination, abomination. Yeah, okay. there. That you know, like now. We do see that in Revelation 13, right? We all know yeah. about the mark of the beast and worshiping the image of the beast and all of that. And then halfway through, he goes in and... Right, and, and, and here's the thing, is that just like Gabriel had said here to Daniel, is that in the middle of the week, he's going to cause the sacrifices and so forth to cease. So what you see is when you get to this period right here, this is kind of a nexus. We generally call this the Tribulation Week, or the Tribulation, actually the Great Tribulation. The whole week isn't the Great Tribulation, that's a misnomer. The second half is the Great Tribulation. So we're going to see a lot of events all the way up, you know, Chapter 9 type of events all the way up through about there. And then we get chapter 11, 12, 13, all begin, 14 a little bit, begin right here in the Great Tribulation, and things really wrap up and get crazy here. And here's also where the abomination, in the middle of the week is where the abomination of desolation takes place. And that is, um, who's got handy 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? Remember we studied that a little bit? Yeah, right. <laughs> Chapter two, verse, verse one. Verse so go ahead, start on the first verse, and we're just gonna go through no more than about eight, eight verses. But we can we can stop through part of it. But now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind and trouble either by spirit or by word or by letter, as it is from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of the lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restraineth will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Here we go. So what we've got is we've got kind of a time frame here of what goes on. Thank you for reading that. Okay. So at some point, we've got these events that happen in the middle of the book of Revelation. But Paul's saying... Paul is responding to the Thessalonians in the second letter because after all this information he passed on before when he was with them, and we see some of that in 1 Thessalonians about wrath, and don't worry about wrath, your children of light, not darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief in the night, don't worry about it kind of a thing. Um, then somebody was coming along and, and forging letters or something like that and trying to say that, well, you know, you, they, you missed the boat and your loved ones are, you know, they missed the boat too because 
you know, they died and they don't get to go and all this. different stories were coming out and very confusing and they were concerned so Paul had to set them straight and Paul told them a couple of things. One is that the man of sin is not going to be revealed or these things aren't really going to get to that point until the man of sin is revealed. The man of sin is not going to be revealed until what happens? The restrainer is taken out of the way. And it's he who restrains. So some people will try to say the restrainer is a this, or the restrainer is a that. Well, the restrainer is a he. And who restrains and keeps at bay all the wickedness in the world from getting just completely and totally out of hand? Well, it's got to be the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's got to be taken out of the way. Now, does that mean that we're, we, the church, are sitting here as believers, we know that, as Paul said to the Corinthians, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not all believers, no believer had that before Acts chapter 2. Okay? We don't know about afterwards. Some people will debate whether or not, you know, there will be indwelling of the Holy Spirit still during the tribulation, but he just, the Holy Spirit will be there, but he just won't be restraining. I don't know, it's, it's kind of dodgy. I don't really, it doesn't really make much sense to me. Um, the Holy Spirit is everywhere. Like David said, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. So God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But he's not going to always keep performing the same task. The restrainer is taken out of the way, and we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Well, is the restrainer going to be taken away from us? Or does that mean that's the rapture and that's when we go? So the restrainer has got to be taken out of the way first before the man of sin is revealed. So, somehow we got to have a temple up here. And we got to have the man of sin revealed. Because you're going to end up with sacrifices. As it says in Daniel, and as it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's going to stand in the holy place and declare himself as being God. So, there's... A fair amount here that has to happen, and this is all in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Um, what gets kind of questionable is between rapture and when the tribulation starts, we don't know what the gap is. The rapture does not start the tribulation. What starts the tribulation is he will make a covenant or he'll make an agreement, as it says in Daniel, for one week. So he's going to make a seven-year agreement. A peace agreement. They say you don't know what time, but you're talking a year, two years. I mean, it's not a long term. I don't even think it's a year or two years. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown of how I think it's going to go down. The way I think it's going to go down, you guys are kind of watching the news now and seeing what's going on, and, and there's a lot of saber rattling right now, for instance, with Russia and with Iran, and uh, we know what's going on with uh, some of the Muslim nations around Israel, right? And they all hate Israel. Israel, meanwhile, has um, broken all kinds of records with being uh, with discoveries for natural gas and for oil under them. Um, probably, they're guessing, probably even more than Saudi Arabia has underneath them. So now everybody wants some kind of a deal, wants some, or by some means to get a hold of some of that oil and natural gas that Israel has. And um, I think Israel would be willing to do that with some caveats and you know with some agreements that these other nations aren't willing to to go for. So we see Russia right now once again amassing, getting ready to go into Ukraine. Ukraine's got oil, and Russia wants that oil. Well, that's not all going to work out, and there's, uh, it's looking more and more now that Russia might be getting ready to invade again. And there's lots of finger-waggling from different nation-states, NATO and so forth, United States, saying, don't do it, you, know, you better not, kind of a thing. Well, we know that what happens in the Gog and Magog War in Ezekiel 38, 
it's those very same nations in Turkey and, and uh, Ethiopia and some of these other surrounding nations are supposed to invade Israel and go after Jerusalem. Um, Gog is the man, the leader. Magog is the coalition. And um, some people say it's Turkey, and it could be Turkey. Those borders move. They're very flexible. So, yeah, I'm sure there's, you know. Uh, one of the things that came out recently about um, Afghanistan, and I was listening to this interview from uh, an expert who was used to at one time be a SEAL team member over there in Afghanistan. They were talking about all the warlords and things that's going on and talking about what's going on in Afghanistan and leaving Afghanistan and what the ramifications are that uh, with the United States leaving and the way that they left is he's starting to say, you know, you don't understand. Afghanistan is not a country. It's borders that the Western world has kind of drawn around and some of the other neighboring states you know, the Eastern Bloc and so forth. It's kind of like, there's one sort of calling it Afghanistan, you could call it the Badlands, just generally it's, you know, there be dragons. There's, you, you've got all these tribes and warlords who run things over there on different economies and some of it's, some of it's drugs and whatever else, and, and the lines blur depending on who takes over what and who wins what little skirmish or whatever. So it's, you know, like dozens of little nation states over there. So it's kind of crazy. So um, anyway, but the one thing they all have in common is that none of them like Israel, but they would all like to, you know, plunder Israel. So that's part of the thing that happens in uh, Ezekiel 38 is God is saying, you know, why are you here if you come to take booty and you come to plunder that kind of thing so we know in the narrative it says that they invade from the north what is to the north of israel syria who's camped out just outside of israel right now in syria literally right across you know some razor wire and chain link fence and stuff there you got Russia's encamped there, Iran is encamped there, and I don't know who else is encamped there. Um, Hezbollah and other groups, they all have their little representation, representative groups in there. Um, and we don't, I don't know who else over there, but I'm sure that they're all represented by these Ezekiel 38 Gog and Magog nations. So, what we have is we have one week of years in Daniel's prophecy. We've got a one week of years agreement that goes on. In after the Gog and Magog war, in Ezekiel 39 primarily, it's going to talk, start talking about how you've got a year's or seven years worth of burning weapons as fuel because what's going to happen is these nations are going to go against Israel and they're going to lose because nobody else is going to stand up for Israel. They're going to stand alone except God's going to intervene. Does anybody here in this room right now think that the current administration in the U.S. will step in, would step in and help out Israel if these nations came against <laughs> I wish he does not. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Trump, maybe. Uh, Trump would. Yes, because he liked Israel. Yeah. Netanyahu, but no. And Netanyahu Biden, would. Biden, yes. no. Biden, no, probably not. No. Uh, what we see in Ezekiel 38 with the Gog and Magog war is it's all out. And you see these nations coming in over the border and they're saying, we're coming for you. Then you see, you know, fire and brimstone. God is going to make hay of them on behalf of Israel. And it's it's going to go quickly. So when are you talking about on the timeline right now? What we're talking about right now would be, right. I think it would be probably here. Oh. Let me get my handy dandy marker. Um, some people 
sometime in here. Mm -hmm. Some people will think, um, how do I can target? Some people will think that um, the Gog and Magog war could happen like now. It's kind of a setup, preamble kind of a thing. And some people say, well, the Gog and Magog war, it's the same thing as Armageddon. We'll get into reasons why that can't be the case. Um, but part of what sets the time period where Gog and Magog should happen, again, is Ezekiel 39, which says a certain number of years that they're going to be burying bodies, a lot of bodies. But then seven years, Israel, in the aftermath, is going to be burning the weapons as fuel. I don't know what technology that is. I don't know if it's some type of a nuclear type of a deal where they recycle and burn because it's contaminated, so there's a way they can burn it, clean it before uh, whatever burns off in the air, and use it as a, in a power plant. So it says that Israel's going to be burning the weapons for, I don't think they're just going to open air and just pour gasoline on it and just burn them. They're going to be burning them as fuel. So I think they're probably going to use some technology those Jews are pretty crafty, and they come up with some cool technology, and they can do it pretty quick. I imagine there's going to be something they'll come up with that will they'll find a way of using it to power um, part of the nation or all of the nation or whatever. But anyway, that happens we'll for seven gone, years. Right? We'll, we'll, we'll be gone is, is my firm belief, and the reason why I believe this, and, and, and this is weird because, um, maybe, here we go again on our rabbit trail. We... I was puzzling over this for a, a long time, um, back and forth over the years. And then uh, I was reading it one day, and the words just kind of hit me in a way they never really had before. And I thought, wait, well, why didn't I see that before? That's always been written there. It's not like it just popped up in my Bible yesterday. Why didn't I see this? And the words are, are this. If you look in Ezekiel 38, and you can do it now or you can do it later, but um, starting in verse 16, the Lord is saying, you will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. So that's a big coalition of armies, right? It will be in the latter days that I will bring you against my land. So God is the one doing this. So that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. So whatever I do to you, Gog, and that some people will say now that Putin would be the ideal person in that position right now. You know, if he's still alive at the time, it's somebody like him. Thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? In other words, here in the book of Ezekiel. Is that you, Putin? No. <laughs> who prophesied for years in those days that I would bring you against them. Verse 18 says, And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. So he's going to really show himself. The mountains will be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. So that part of the world over there, he's going to do all kinds of things. But notice again what... what uh, what he says up here, what is it, in, in verse um, 19, about his wrath. And that, that caught my eye because I just read in 1 Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 4 and chapter 5 about how that day isn't for us and how we're not appointed to wrath. So you've got great clouds of people. And you've got these nation states over there that are going to go against Israel, and God's going to pour out great wrath on them. Um, fire and brimstone and shake mountains and do all kinds of throw, th throw things down. 
That's God's wrath, and we're not appointed to wrath. So there's not going to be any believers in that part of the world where that happens at that time. Nobody in, you know, the Jerusalem area up there in the mountains who is a believer. We don't really see wrath, do we, during the time when the church is here on the earth, the bride of Christ? So that's a period of wrath. To me, that wrath, where God is speaking to God, that sounds like after the rapture, after the restrainer is gone. But yet there has to be seven years. So the way I kind of see it going down is, in the beginning here, you're going to have the rapture and... I don't even think the man of sin is necessarily known at that time. Remember, he's got to be revealed, and he's got to do this, that, and the other, and the restrainer's got to be taken out of the way. I think what happens is we have this big, brief war, and it's an all-out war. We had, in 1967, you had a six-days war in Israel. The one that lasted the longest, really, was 1973, and that was... A little over a month. So we're going to have this brief, big, fiery war, and that God is going to make it brief, right? He's going to wrap it up really quick, it sounds like. He's going to pounce right on those nations for coming after his people in his land. So what was it in 1948? What were the, what were the events that brought Israel together in the land and made all these nations who normally would not be necessarily particularly friendly toward Israel, all of a sudden, the Holocaust. The Holocaust. So you had this great wartime thing happen, and all these, to find out you had these prison camps and you had six million Jews slaughtered in the Holocaust, who was going to speak up at that time and say, no, they don't get their own country? You know, no, we're not going to, nobody's going to do that. So they went to war with, it. yeah, they went to war with them right afterwards, mind you. Some of them still got weapons and went after them. But they had sympathy, the sympathy of the world at the time. Now, this type of a thing we have this coalition of all these countries go over, and God's going to reveal himself. Time of miracles really only, you got times of miracles when in the Bible, not very many places, you know, times of Noah when you had that happen. And some of the prophets, you know, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, you know, these miracle times. Smatterings here and there. Um, and, you know, you could say all kinds of things are miracles. You know, the birth of a baby is a miracle. But, you know, what I'm talking about is the big, where God's revealing, showing himself. The time of Christ. We haven't really had anything since the time of Christ. So that's not like an everyday type of a thing. But particularly, though, um, where God is revealing himself to Israel and within Israel, and God is displaying himself in his glory. Well, we've been, Israel's been on pause for 2,000 years. So this timing kind of works out really well, where the church is out of the way. Romans 11, um, where Israel is grafted back in, and the times for Israel begins again, right? The prophetic clock for Israel begins again. The 70 weeks of Daniel that Gabriel gave Daniel is all about Israel and the Messiah, and the, Israel's relationship to the Messiah. So we've had all this history, it stops when Messiah is cut off. Um, it's no longer about Israel for a while. God has stopped everything, and we have this mystery, as Paul called it, of the church age, the age of grace. So we're in this period here, and we're in the church age. We're the bride of Christ. We're dwelt by God himself. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we've got this church age. We're raptured. The prophetic clock starts again for Israel. And it's a time of miracles again. God intervening and fire and brimstone on behalf of Israel. So this is a perfect time right here for um, Gog and Magog and the seven years. 
of burning weapons, a seven-year peace agreement. It would be a perfect time for now the man of sin reveals himself, and he's going to come in. He's got the solutions. Everybody's looking for an answer. Um, he comes in as a fake messiah. Okay, because people are, whoa, God is real, look at this. Did you hear them sharing these stories and who knows what's on people's cell phones and all these miraculous, wonderful, weird things that people are going to say, wow, there's there's definitely a supreme being out there. Some, and who knows what other lie is going to come up. We don't know. Some people say there's going to be a lot of you know great deception that might involve UFOs and, and literally God only knows what. So it's going to be a time of supernatural, weird, crazy stuff. So it would be a perfect time for the Antichrist to step in as the Messiah. Because Antichrist doesn't mean he's like the opposite of Christ. A lot of people think that. A better translation instead of Antichrist is pseudo-Christ. He's a fake Christ. He's a pretender. He's going to come in on his white horse. He's, uh, he's got a bow. No arrows. Yeah, he's Prince Charming. And he's going to come in with a peace agreement. And he's going to work out something. Coincidental to that, um, there are discussions. We know where the temple should be. Biblically, the temple should be in the city of David. And maybe that's where the third temple will be. I don't know. But on the Temple Mount, for our purposes here, there has been some discussion of opening the Temple Mount on uh, Fridays for the Muslims to have as their, they have access to it for worship. They could build the temple there and the Jews would have it on the Sabbath, on the sixth day that we know here as a Saturday. And then the Christians would have access on Sunday. And nobody step on each other's toes. So he's gonna come in, he's gonna do some fancy footwork to try to make a, a false peace in the world. Um, so there's going to be peace in the world with the fa a false antichrist or a false Christ rather is going to come in to make false peace in the world. Remind me again, when is the temple supposed to be built before the rapture? Now, uh, I suppose it could be they have all the implements ready now. Mm -hmm. they have everything ready. They, they literally just well, like, like, they everything. Like, like, like they've trained, they have the DNA now where they can separate out the tribes the tribe. and they're mm -hmm. already training the Levites. They have all the things that go inside made, all the implements or whatever. The heifers have been um, being born. They started in the 80s, I think, the red heifer started. There was like one, uh, not blameless, what's the word, pure, unpunished. Yeah, they, they can't. Um, they have, literally, they have the plans for it. You can get online and find the mm -hmm. Sanhedrin. Yeah. They have the plans. That they picked out the people that literally they just well, need to well, The temple, the, the parts, the, land, well, the parts right? they've got a warehoused, you know, all the different oh, parts. Really? They've got the stone okay. cut, the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, which is the last part so of the foundation. What are they waiting cut. for? The land? Well, or? what they're waiting for now, yes, what they're waiting for now is access. They think right now, although it's changing, there's a, a sea change happening. But right now, they're waiting for access to the Temple Mount and for politics to work out in a way that will give them access because right now, you've got um, the Dome of the Rock Mosque is up there. There's a wall up there. They're not even allowed much of the time to even get access to the Temple Mount. Uh, they've got the Western Wall, what they call the Western Wall up there that they're worshiping at. So I interrupted you. So when? Yeah. So, oh, I'm somewhere, somewhere up in here. Every time you said something, I have more questions. Yeah. So what does the Bible, what do you think the Bible says about when it might be? Temple done? specifically, nothing. Some people will tie that into the peace agreement that the man of sin or the Antichrist um, inaugurates. Um, and that works. I don't have a problem with that. They've got everything together, but right now they need that peace agreement, see? So for him to step in at this point and have the sympathy of the world, um, because all these nations came after Israel, they deserve to have their own temple. So he makes a, a seven-year agreement, which is interesting seven years um, and somewhere he sees to a temple being built um, they say the temple can be built easily within a half a year they've, they've got I mean constructed mm -hmm. 
everything's prefabbed as far as I know. I mean, they've got the cedar that they need. They've got the gold they need to line it. Netanyahu has said in the past they know right where the um, Ark of the Covenant is. And he says, we're prepared to, to get it whenever the time's ready. He but didn't say where it was. Do understand what we're talking about as far as what happens yeah. after it's built and the rapture and the seven years? And um, the Jews? Or they just want a temple and that's all they're thinking about? Most of the Jews are secular. Yeah. And they, I don't think they... They know anything other than, uh, you know, they're always, it's just, they've always been surrounded by enemies and so mm -hmm. forth, and they know their history. Many of them are, are not believers at all. You know, some might believe in a supreme being, believe in God. You know, yeah, God's on our side, but they're completely secular for the most part. Mm -hmm. And then there are more Orthodox Jews who um, are the ones you see at the Wailing Wall during the holidays, the holy days. Um, the Moadim and they've got you know, the guys with the black hats on and they're at the wall and they're praying each time they're doing this it's a prayer and they're praying they're stuffing their prayers in the wall and the cracks and so forth some are, are praying, crying for the Messiah wailing at, at the wailing wall asking for the Messiah you got people rabbis, prominent well known rabbis now we say oh yeah uh, I've met the Messiah and he was almost ready to reveal himself. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. you know, it kind of makes sense that with the sympathy of the world now, that this guy would step up and, and start performing these miracles. Maybe he claimed to be the one who brought down fire and brimstone, and then he might do some tricks or whatever to demonstrate that he is it, that he is the Messiah. Come to deliver just like in Jesus' day, they weren't looking for a suffering Messiah to die on a cross for their sins. They're looking for the rescuer to come on the white horse. So this Messiah, Antichrist, man of sin, shows up. He's got all the answers. He's going to bring peace. He works out possibility for them to build their temple and have their temples. They have their temple. Then some events happen, some key events happen, involving Satan in the heavens and war in the heavens and so forth. All kinds of things happen. Um... Uh, an, an attempt or actually uh, the murder of the Antichrist at some point. You know, loses an eye, loses an arm, whatever. And possessed by Satan, just like Satan possessed Judas um, like before he betrayed Jesus. Lots of key events happen right here to kick off. And, and part of that would be Satan possesses Antichrist then Satan's got a scorched earth policy. He's angry. He knows his time is short, it says in Revelation. So it's a scorched earth policy. He starts going after Antichrist's own system, world system and world religious system. It goes after the false prophet, goes after that system, goes after Israel, goes after believers, erects this statue and demands it's worshipped. Uh, the false prophet demands it's worshipped. Um, the mark of the beast, all this stuff, all starts right here in the middle. No more sacrifices. He commands the sacrifices are stopped, as Daniel says, and as, you know, except what prophecies say. And things get really go from bad to worse at that point. Um, so that's kind of the sweep of what Gabriel told Daniel, and that's kind of where Jesus is landing right here. So he says, "Watch for this." I like how you said um, that because I never made this connection to how in the Old Testament they didn't have the filling of the Spirit. They had all the miracles and signs. And then we have the, Acts 2, we have the filling of the Spirit, we have the church age. Then the restrainer goes out and we go back to old, the Old Testament, Israel's time, and then you're back with the miracles and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, I knew this information, but putting it that way towards Israel's time again, so that's why the miracles and signs and wonders all come back into play. Somebody wants to put it that the clock for Israel stopped at seven minutes to midnight. Yeah, but I just and never made the distinction that no yeah. filling, filling, no filling again, yeah. because it starts their time again. So he has to, I mean, it just makes more sense. It's even, he has to take the restrainer out, the Holy Spirit, all of us. He has to take the bride out to mm -hmm. start with, like, the old rules again, or the Old Testament rules or whatever. Yeah. So. Interesting stuff. So believe it or not, I we we did get through that question, 
Um, are we going to meet next week, or is what's what's the Christmas holiday season going to look for everybody? Are are y'all going to who are here tonight going to make it? Be able to make it for now? You're not. So we. Okay, so what we'll probably do then is, is the we'll two weeks off. take the next two okay. weeks off, okay? Because it's kind of hectic this time of year with Christmas stuff and visiting and so forth. So you got plenty of time to read, study, review. We did go through the first two questions. We've got a little bit more we can cover with the second part there. Who will, uh, what will be the sign of your coming? We've got a little bit more we can cover. And um, then we'll zoom from there right into end of the end of the age. And that part's really exciting because that's when we get into some really cool stuff. And it'll be better after those two weeks anyway because then Larry will be back and he's the one who raised the question. Wait a minute, what about days of Noah? You know, and it's the question of, and I want you to ask this of yourself when you read the rest of the chapter. The days of Noah, does it describe the beginning of the tribulation? See the question mark? Or the days of Noah, is it described more in this period here? And that's the question. A lot of people, when he quoted MacArthur, a lot of people quote it like it's talking about right before the second coming. You've got to remember now, this period of here is all the day of wrath. It's all the day of the Lord. It's all the day of judgment. It consummates and it reaches its peak at, when, at the second coming, when Jesus returns to earth at the second coming. But it is all God's judgment, the whole seven-year period. So don't be thinking, you know, well, wow, we don't have the day of the Lord until the second coming. Because it's all the day of the Lord, all the day of his wrath, all the time of Jacob's trouble. It's all tribulation. Middle of the week starts the great tribulation, as Jesus said. Okay? So as you're reading, keep those things in your mind. Nobody wants to read the rest of Matthew. Yeah. What should we be reading? Yeah, Matthew. I'm gonna read all, all of. Uh, I, I would encourage you to read all of Matthew again. I know it's a busy time of year, but you got a couple of weeks. Read. Yeah. Try to read Matthew a couple, okay. a couple more times. But yeah, read the rest of Matthew. All of Matthew or 24. Ma 24. Yeah. Okay. 24. Well, you can read all of Matthew. Oh, you know what? I'm not gonna tell you nothing. <laughs> but uh, you know, when we when we get into, you know, after. Uh, Verse 27 and so forth, 28, 29, all the way through the end. Um, read all that about the coming of the age. And um, it comes from reading re repetitively that things start to sort out and remind a little bit more and it starts to fall together for you. Um, I've found in any passage that's you find kind of trouble. Well, and I think I like that you're doing this and it's, oh, I like that we're getting comfortable with each other and we can just sit and ask these questions we've all had. And listening to your answer to other people, it, it's like, oh wow, I never thought about it. I mean, we've been stubbing your wife forever now, and <laughs> you know, I mean, I hear this stuff, but sometimes hearing it a different way or a different question. I mean, even for me, it's like, oh yeah, I didn't think about, you know. So. Well, sometimes we don't know what questions. It didn't occur to us to ask some questions that somebody else yeah. might have that makes something else that we knew click yeah. into place. Puzzle pieces don't click. Know don't, know. Don't, know. don't know what you don't know. I got a question. Okay. Yes. Where he says, do you? <laughs> Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Paul in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Is that where he told it? I mean... What he was talking about is he had visited out there, but he did cover some of the material, as we know, in um, in First Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5. Okay. Um, and that's where he's... That's where you have... That's the famous rapture passage... Harpazo, that's where you have the famous Harpazo verse, which is Latin is where we get the word for rapture. But Harpazo is um, a great snatching away or taking. Okay. Caught up, it'll say in a lot of English translations, we be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Second coming, what happens? Does Jesus catch us up to meet him in the air? No. no he comes down and is foot settles down on the Mount of Olives, right? With this a different event. So that's where rapture, the word rapture comes from. And then similar events point to the rapture along the way. And that's kind of what we're looking at, trying to verify and define that um, and see if that plugs in. If it plugs in at all in the book of Revelation, it's going to happen after the churches of chapters 2 and 3 
and right at the head of Revelation chapter 4. And that's why we're taking this little side road. So it, 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 where it says, when I was with you. At Thessalonica. Yeah, Paul, you know, we know he was on these missionary right. journeys and he went to, yeah. He told it to, or revealed it to. I mean, yeah, he, he told it. It wasn't I mean, some Matthew, Mark, Luke. No, Paul was, Paul, was, Paul was addressing to the church at Thessalonica that, hey, when I was with you guys, I told you guys this stuff. Don't you remember when I told you this okay. stuff? Because the, the poor Thessalonians were getting some fake letters. You know, so we know like at Corinth, they had other people who were trying to say, no, Paul's not an apostle, I'm an apostle. We got that today, right? So, uh, I just always wondered what he meant by it. I told you these things, you know. Yeah. But he don't really tell who he said to. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, to the Thessalonians, okay. but then, you know, um, he does reveal what some of the discussion was in, in the letter. But we, when he was with them, I mean, he, you're a visiting pastor and apostle and whatever else uh, at a church, and how long did he stay there? And I'm sure you have lots of lengthy conversations that are a lot longer than the five chapters of First Thessalonians. So, we'll say some of the letters, though, he just wrote, he didn't go there. You know? There's a third letter to, to, to Corinth. We don't know what. Yeah, it's gone. And some people say, well, the same letter that was Corinth was actually this letter over here, too. It went to both of them. Well, we don't know. We don't know. That's all good. I would it be a fly on the wall back there, though, and hear some of those discussions, those conversations with Paul. So, eh, maybe in the future we'll already have the answers to a lot of them, but anyway. Any more questions? Yes? Um, so at the end of Ezekiel 38, where it says, um, in verse 23, it says, So I will show you my greatness and my holiness, and make myself known in the eyes of many nations, and then they will know that I am the Lord. And so, are you saying, or is the Bible saying, that um, that at the end of this war, that they will know that this was God, and that prepares a way for the Antichrist? I, I think both, really. Mm -hmm. um, God is going to reveal himself. He's going to reveal himself to the world. Um, but Jesus revealed himself to the world, and did everybody become believers? Well, of course not. You know, But he did these miracles and things, and how they stood there and watched Jesus do miracles... And they tried to defame him and, and debunk him and still tried to take him out and stone him. Well, yeah, what are you doing, you know, Jesus going and healing this guy of his blindness on, you know, the Sabbath? Stone him, you know. Well, you made this guy walk? You did it on the Sabbath? Stone him. Well, how profane is that? So um, we know there's a difference between what people see and what they witness intellectually and where their belief True belief, really. Is. But they can't have true belief without the Holy Spirit. They can't so. have true. Well, they did in the Old Testament, not in dwelling on the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit moved on people to yeah. make people believe. That will still be going on during the tribulation. Yeah. It will still be the work of the Holy Spirit. He just will not be in his, you know, his mode of, of restraining. That's the main thing we'll get out of that with the restrainer. Not just so much the rapture. Um, the rapture. I mostly get out of, well, we got a period of wrath when the Antichrist, this is God's judgment on the world. The bride of Christ is not going to be judged on the earth. And it's a time of wrath, it says in First Thessalonians, right? So Paul told them, you don't need to worry about that time. That's for them, us, them. Remember about we, they, us, them, that language in the Thessalonians. So he makes that distinction, and also Revelation 3.10. Remember, it's stuff that's going to come, trouble that comes upon the whole earth. But you are going to escape that. And he uses the word escape, Revelation 3.10. So how does that happen? How do you have trouble on the whole earth, and you have those who dwell on the earth, which would be anybody who dwells on the earth, right? But you are going to be, so Revelation 3.10 is very powerful. And people who want to deny the rapture, want to deny a you know, global, you know, uh, great tribulation period and all of that, they have issues with that. You know, 
try to do all kinds of dances and things to try to get around it. Gymnastics, theological gymnastics. It should be an Olympic event. Um, so did that make sense? So it's just because God reveals that, himself. So saying that when he says they will, they will know that I'm the Lord, is it saying that like some people will believe at that point? I just, I just think that that's, um, that, you know, that kind of language is, you know, I'm going to show you who's boss. They're going to find out who's in charge. Yeah. Okay. So it's just kind of a general broad statement. Not that everybody's going to become believers by any means. Mm -hmm. It's just God is going to reveal himself in a great huge way that's undeniable. But, you know, most of the world will still deny it. What verse were you reading? Verse 23. Verse 23. Yeah, I noticed that verse too before you mentioned it. Mm. And they will know that I am Lord. Mm -hmm. I will make myself known to many nations. See this, but I think mostly, especially who he's talking to, all the nations of the world will see this. You know, but mostly, I think the focus, since the prophetic clock starts here for Israel, the focus is mostly going to be, this will be what starts the conversion of how the Lord will use this for Israel. Because remember, their eyes are blind, blinded for a season. God's going to take the blinders off at some point, Revelation, or Revelation, Romans 11, okay? And I think those are events that the Lord will use. Out of that will come maybe the 144,000, 12,000 from each of the tribes. And so God will begin this great revival that starts in Israel among the Jews. So to start fulfilling, to, again, well, the fulfillment of that prophecy. Let me get in the right translation here. It also says in year 17, thus says the Lord God, um, are you he of whom I have spoken in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? In the NLT, it even says better, it says, this is what the Sovereign Lord asks. Are you the one I was talking about long ago when I announced through Israel's prophets that in the future I would bring you against my people? But this is what the Sovereign Lord says. When Gog invades the land of Israel, my fury will boil over. In my jealousy and blazing anger, I promise a mighty shaking in the land of Israel on that day. All living things, the fish in the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals of the field, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and blah, 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 blah. Um, I will summon, 21, I will summon the sword against you, that's his judgment, on all the hills of Israel, says the Sovereign Lord. Your men will turn their swords against each other. I will punish you and your enemies with disease. And he's, he's pretty much saying, I'm the Sovereign God. I wrote about these things way back when, and I'm going to make them happen and do these things so you will all know that I am God. Can and, I, he, and he says, I'm the Sovereign. Can I blow your minds a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Why not? And, and some of you might have heard me say this before, but I think what we're, we're, the outcome of Ezekiel 38 is what you were reading about in Revelation chapter 6. Yes. The seals of God. Yes. The seal judgments. Mm -hmm. With that in mind, you read Ezekiel 38, you've got two weeks. Read Ezekiel 38 about that. And 39 would be interesting too. But then also read Revelation chapter 6. Yeah. Because... The Lamb of God, Jesus, opens up the seals and read it like it could possibly be that what we see with uh, the four horsemen judgments and all that that comes upon the earth. These are the results that you will see from war. Where you've got all these dead bodies. Who knows what kind of chemical warfare is going on? So you end up with pestilence and stuff because you've got bodies laying around and it's going to take months to bury them. We have in Ezekiel 39. So you've got disease. Um, it messes up with the uh, probably the world's economy and so forth. So you've got famine. You've got people starving. Supply chain is broken. Um, so some of the events that you will read about in uh, Revelation chapter 6, do fit, including to your Revelation, or your Revelation, Ezekiel 38, 23, thing about the whole world seeing and God and saying, well, yeah, this is, you also have the people who are hiding out, it's like, everybody head for the bunkers. 
Well, it says in Revelation 6 that people will run into caves and hide. They have these dumps, deep underground military bunkers and other things. The elites of the world, the wealthy and so forth, will run into some of these bunkers and hide. And they're going to be crying out to the rocks fall on this, for the Lamb of God is coming. He's, you know, he's bringing his wrath. It's the wrath of the Lamb. I've heard about this. You know, my friend told me about this. It's Jesus, and he's angry. You know, follow us. You know, they're crying out for the rocks and the bunkers to follow them by the time you get to the end of the seal judgments. So I'll yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at that, and they will know that God isn't necessary. I'm looking here. There's a few, there's a few definitions in the original Testament Hebrew. Um, it's not the same, though, as like I'm fully known or we intimately know him. But it's one of those things where I'm going to do all these things and show my sovereign. That's why he, the sovereign one. And again, like he said, this is in Ezekiel 38. He's telling them what's going to happen and what he's going to do and why he's going to do it. So when it happens, there's no, I mean, you can't, that's the great thing about, we were just talking about this, uh, Chuck Missler says, uh, he's like, the Bible's so incredible because you can take a page or two out and all the promises, all of everything will still, you can still find redeeming, you can find all the promises are good. So here he says, I mean, what you're just talking about in the 38 literally reads like Revelation. I'm going to do all these things and mm -hmm. torrential rains and hailstone and fire and burning soul. In this way, I will show my greatness, holiness, and I will make myself known to all the nations of the world that they will know that I am. Pretty much think about it like I am God. I am the one doing this. I am sovereign. Mm -hmm. I am in control, not you. Intellectually. Yeah. Not experientially as relationally, yeah. like yeah. you're saying. Just intellectually, so not that relationally. You? It, it's yeah. a, it's a, people will point and uh, that's God. Not that they'll they accept won't follow, it. follow. But yes. They'll but they'll know. That was God. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the no pain remember, pain. the demons know, right. the demons believe, but they tremble. But they don't. They don't follow the army. Good questions. See, what, so, I, what I was asking is, um, he revealed the rapture. I want to get this right. He revealed the rapture to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But he revealed the second coming to the Thessalonians. <laughs> the Thessalonian. <laughs> uh, the, the rapture is one of those mysteries that uh, this is part of the reason why I'm looking at Matthew 24 here. Is that if you look between the lines in some of this, you can see that with this is a couple different events he's talking about here, but they're confused. They're confused anyway because they weren't expecting the Messiah to come the first time and then have to die. They missed all that from Isaiah and whatever else. They kind of forgot conveniently a lot of that. They're looking for the Messiah on the white horse. So a lot of this stuff is confounding and confusing anyway. Jesus, his ministry initially here was to bring the gospel, bring it to the Jews. They were promised to be given up. They were given the gospel. Okay, They rejected it. Well, it took some years before the gospel, you know, it got opened up to his other sheep, the Gentiles, the world. So the Jew first, and then also the Gentiles. So that came, and all the things that impact the Gentiles became clarified. Those mysteries became clarified more in the epistles, like especially Paul's epistles. So you got rapture. You got that kind of in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, start about, it's a long chapter, but start about chapter, or verse 50, to get kind of a flow of context. That's where you got the whole twinkling of an eye, will be changed in a moment, and all this and in 1 Thessalonians, you've got Revelation 3 chance. You've got some things that pull together. Jesus did kind of hint at, at um, some rapture stuff in John 14. But they're hints. And they're still kind of a mystery. When they're kind of, what do they mean? I'm not sure if I know. Hmm. So, clarified later on in the epistles. That's an interesting study, too, is to find every place in the New Testament where we talked about a mystery and count the number of mysteries there are and what they all mean and that type of thing. In case you're ever looking for something to study and you want something. I'm good. You're good for a while, aren't right? you? You're stuck in <laughs> Isaiah. You're, you're going to be living in Isaiah for a while. So, All right. Well, let's wrap it up, and then we can continue to talk if if there are more questions, if more questions occur and it can happen. Uh, Lord, thank you again for uh, 
shining light here and revealing some cool things about your word, uh, some things that are so confounding. Uh, we can see patterns, Lord, and we just want to put them together the right way. We don't want to profane your name or your word by um, mixing and matching where they don't make sense. Uh, Lord, we should always question. We always want to be Bereans. We want to make sure that we're accurate in your word. And I, and, um, I thank you for the questions here tonight. And I pray that the right questions and the right challenges will come up too in case uh, we're looking at something the wrong way or there's alternative ways to look at something. And we just we want to do honor by you, God. We want to see you glorified in all things. But either way, God, we know that you're coming again. However that shakes out, we know that you're coming again. And Lord, we pray sooner rather than later. I would prefer, and I'm sure I have the agreement of everybody else in this room, I would prefer to not even be able to meet the next time that uh, you'd take us out of here before that happens, Lord. So even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.